The Minnesota House of Representatives Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform will come to order. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Vice. Present. Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hewitt, excused. Representative Cleavorn. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Yes. Representative Mueller. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. Representative Pinto. Representative Pinto. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh present. Representative Vang. Representative present. Representative Zhang excused. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Pinto. That concludes roll call. Very well. Uh, members, uh, a uh, clerk, or rather a, <laughs> a quorum uh, is present. Um, and uh, let me just uh, do a, a simple olive branch, uh, reach out to my uh, colleague, Representative Lucero, who reached out to me yesterday for a phone call. And uh, Representative Lucero, uh, if you're available today, I'm, I, I'll, I'll get back to you if that's good. In the meantime, would you be so kind as to move our minutes of Friday, Friday January 12th? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. So, and I so moved. Very well. Representative Lucero moves adoption of the minutes of January 12th discussion. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 A false safe sign. Motion prevails and the minutes of Friday, January 12th, for this committee are hereby adopted. Representative Lucero, thank you. I'll give you a call later on uh, uh, if you're available. Um, with that, uh, members, we have uh, three uh, bills up for uh, discussion and action uh, today. Uh, this is uh, part of a week of bills where we're going to be looking at uh, survivor uh, advocacy. Uh, uh, issues. Uh, and so uh, a number of bills related to sexual uh, assault crimes, um, uh, investigations, uh, interventions, uh, as well as consequences uh, for uh, those, those uh, offense, for convictions of those offenses. Um, today, uh, we have three bills, and we're going to begin with uh, House File 295, Representative Muller, it's always a delight to, rep to uh, have Representative Muller uh, back before us. And so Representative Muller, the chair will move to refer House File 295 to the Committee on Ways and Needs. Please come forward, state your name for the record, and let's begin the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It is great to be back again. So House File 295 would require the BCA to investigate sexual assaults that are perpetrated by and against members of the Minnesota National Guard. The idea for this bill started a few years ago when I met with Shayla Scholl, a constituent, who told me about the assault she endured as a member of the National Guard at the hands of another Guard member. Through Shayla, I met other brave survivors, some of whom you'll hear from today. And for these crimes, it's up to local law enforcement agencies to investigate them. The survivors told me that the delays investi in investigations at the local level held things up for the military investigation, and the inconsistency among investigations at the local level can also create challenges, not only for survivors, but for the military investigation that follows. Upon hearing from these survivors, I talked to the National Guard and learned about their report, the Minnesota National Guard Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Review Board. The report was released in March of 2020, and it's included in your packet. 
Recommendation 1.4 includes a suggestion that the BCA act as the investigative agency for sexual assault investigations. We've tried to be very clear with the language of the bill that the BCA investigation applies only to Minnesota Guard members who are sexually assaulted by other Minnesota Guard members and the local law enforcement agency knows that both are Guard members. This bill has bipartisan support and Senator Duckworth has introduced the companion and the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault supports this bill. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have several testifiers ready to go. Very well, uh, thank you, Representative Muller. Um, I do have a list here. Um, and so I, what I have is first up, uh, Shayla uh, Shaw, who I had the pleasure of, of briefly meeting as we discussed uh, Texas weather uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Ms. Shaw, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and please provide us with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Specialist Shayla Scholl. I'm here today to testify in support of House File 295. As Kelly stated, I am the reason for this legislation being introduced. Um, in 2016, I was sexually assaulted by another guardsman the night I graduated advanced individual training. I attempted to report the sexual assault, but was discouraged from reporting by local law enforcement. After that experience, I didn't have the motivation or the energy to act on it further. Then in late 2017, after finishing treatment for stage four blood cancer, I received messages on Facebook from a civilian woman asking about what had been done to me. It turns out that everything that was done to me was also done to her too. After confirming to this then stranger that I too was sexually assaulted by the same person, we were both now part of a sexual assault mm -hmm. investigation that would span two and a half years. I spent a little over half of my obligation to the Minnesota Army National Guard in a sexual assault investigation. This isn't uncommon and this is the average length of the investigation according to the state's last SAPR review board. What you don't see is the toll this is taking on me and my family, my friends and my children. By the time this investigation neared its end in mid 2019, I had delivered my first child. Going through a sexual assault case when you were pregnant with your first child is traumatic in its own special way when you have constant ultrasounds. I don't remember any of my children's birth because I requested to be sedated to ensure that I not remember being touched by anybody. I could not breastfeed <laughs> because I did not feel as though I had yet regained control over my own body. The stress and anxiety contributed to postpartum preeclampsia and I almost died. Sorry. <laughs> you see, Mr. Chairman, the reason why I'm here today is not because I wanted justice for myself. I carried the weight of the sexual assault for a year before I reported. I reported after I was approached by somebody else who also endured the sexual assault. But I will forever sit with the guilt of being a service member in a group of civilian women who look to me to be, to meet, to follow, to uphold and exceed the standard of the law and somebody who puts service before self. Reporting put a target on my back that I will have to live with forever, but that is the cross that I will bear if it prevents others from carrying the same. That is one hell of a weight to carry. I continue to serve beyond my obligation to the National Guard, now in the Army Reserve in Texas with my active duty spouse, but Minnesota is and will always be my home. With this legislation, it'll ensure that soldiers and airmen of this organization are entitled to timely and unbiased sexual assault investigations so we can continue to serve in our community safely. I urge you to vote yes on House File 295. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Specialist Shaw. Um, I wish you well uh, on your road to healing. Uh, I trust all of our committee members up here uh, do as well. Um, what, what happened to you, you did not deserve. Um, it is not your fault. Um, there's nothing um, that um, who you are, um, um, you know, uh, merits, um, you know, the, the crime committed on you and, um, and on your person. I wanna thank you for the courage to be here before us uh, in public uh, as you serve um, uh, you know, our citizens, 
Um, obviously, you're serving it um, um, in your service as a guard uh, member, but you're also serving it uh, with the testimony uh, that you've given here today. Uh, let's work together to, um, uh, to honor um, your presence and your words. So thank you for being with us uh, today. If you're able to um, stay for a bit, um, that would be um, uh, not necessary, but welcome. Uh, we, we typically will go through our, our list of testifiers and then there may be uh, questions or comments that com uh, committee members may want to direct at you if that's okay. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Very well, thank you, Specialist Schultz. Uh, next up, we have Donald uh, Kerr, Minnesota Department of Military Affairs, Executive Director. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Kerr. Please state your name for the record and provide us with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, I am Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs. And though the department normally remains neutral in legislation that doesn't apply directly to the military code, uh, we really strongly support this bill because we think it'll close a critical gap that we have in conducting timely, credible, and consistent investigations that we can then use to improve discipline of the National Guard, protect our service members in this area of great concern. And that's my short statement, Mr. Chair, and I, I will hang around in case uh, any members of the chair have any questions. Very well, thank you, Executive Director uh, Kerr. Thank you for your uh, presence here today and for your encouragement of, of this bill. Um, yes, if you could, uh, in case there are questions, we greatly would appreciate that. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. John uh, Thompson, Minnesota National Guard Sexual Assault Response uh, Coordinator. Mr. Thompson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and please give us your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. For the record, I'm John Thompson, the Sexual Assault Response Coordinator for the Minnesota National Guard. Um, the Minnesota National Guard is, it requires a strong base of foundational trust and faith from our membership. And I believe that this bill would help to reinforce um, the trust and faith that we require from our members. Um, anything that we can do to shorten the timelines that Ms. Scholl, Specialist Scholl brought up um, when it comes to the criminal investigative process um, would be a win, not just for the victims and survivors. Um, it would also be a win for the organization and it would also be a win, and th this may be odd to say in this surrounding, but it would be a win for the offenders as well, um, whose lives are often put on hold while the investigation uh, takes place. And I will also stay on uh, the call if there's any questions that I can answer, sir. Thank you. Very well, thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, next, we have uh, Bonnie Daniels, uh, a Minnesota National Guard uh, member. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name. Uh, for the record, and please provide us with your testimony. And Representative Mulder, I, I know earlier before the committee, we were trying to figure out uh, because of some of the technical uh, issues uh, that they might be facing, that there might be a technical uh, a connection, but let's see if that, uh, or technical connection problem, but let's see if that's the case. I think they were muted, Mr. Chair. I think they're, the two are in the same room, perhaps. Oh, okay. Well, let's see if uh, they hear us, if they can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Welcome. <laughs> My name is Bonnie Daniels, and I am here today to testify in support of House File 295. I was sexually assaulted by my master sergeant on January 9th of 2016. It was a drill weekend. Prior to the assault, I had always thought of myself as being extremely goal-oriented, outgoing, happy, and carefree. I just graduated and was planning for my career in the Houston, Texas Medical Center as an x-ray tech. The sexual assault changed everything. My always positive attitude was non-existent. I blamed myself. I told myself things like, it's my fault I had a drink with him. I should have known better. Nobody actually cares about me. Nobody will believe me. I'm annoying people. I'm crazy. People will think I'm overreacting. I can't trust anybody. Men only want me for sex. I'm not good enough. I'm worthless, a nobody. Those feelings of guilt and shame haunted me throughout the investigation, as well as the sickness in my stomach, hearing I wasn't the only one. I had my first thoughts of suicide right before my 29th birthday, a little over a year and a half after I reported the sexual assault. Shortly after my first thoughts of suicide, I drove to the VA in Houston for an appointment with the military sexual trauma coordinator. 
she was surprised I hadn't canceled that appointment because it was the first day Hurricane Harvey hit Houston in August of 2017. I told her I had called for help once before, a few months after I was sexually assaulted because I knew I needed help, but nobody called me back. It took me over a year and a half to call again. If I had canceled that appointment, I didn't know how long it would be before I had the courage to call again, if I even made it that long. The, in the entire investigation took two years to complete. Please vote yes to House File 295. When it comes to, some to someone's life, every second counts. Vote yes to ensure them of a timely investigation, which would provide them with that piece of closure that is needed, that is needed to truly begin to heal. Two years is too long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Daniels. And are, are you still uh, part of the guard at, at this point? I am not. Okay, all right. Uh, Ms. Daniels, um, um, uh, as I shared with, um, uh, with Specialist Joe uh, earlier, um, you have the sincerest best wishes uh, of this committee and your role to hold this. Um, and please know that we see you uh, and we see you in your dignified uh, wholeness. And um, I can't express enough my, uh, my appreciation for your uh, courage uh, to give voice to what needs to be given voice to uh, so that we can end um, the uh, uh, behavior, the crime that was committed against you um, that um, had nothing to do with anything of who you are. So thank you again for being with us here today. If you're able to stay uh, for questions and comments, I, I, I'd appreciate that as well, but uh, there's no need to, but uh, uh, please know that you're welcome uh, to stay for uh, questions period as well. Uh, with that, uh, members, we're gonna move to Sarah uh, Kostick. Uh, Sarah uh, Kostick, if you can state your name for the record and provide us with your testimony, that would be welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sarah Kostic. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill 295. You see, in 2014, I was sexually assaulted by my first sergeant, the senior most enlisted member in the unit, because the National Guard requires us to go to civilian law enforcement to report cases first. I had to report my assault with local law enforcement. The local law enforcement did not take my case serious at all. They asked me if I was at a local bar off post, if I would report it as well. From there, I became one of the first Minnesotans to experience a complex investigation. This is where a team of senior military members travel to Minnesota to investigate the crime. They then continue to Washington National Guard Bureau to review the findings and make a decision. This was almost a two year process. The investigation resulted in an honorable discharge of my first sergeant. Nothing was noted on his record and he continued to serve as a police officer in his hometown. Speed up to 2019, I started talking about my experience and hope that others wouldn't feel alone. I shared my story with a new friend. She replied back, what is his name? Once I told her, she stated, that's not the worst he has done. That statement from her still haunts me today. If it's not the worst he has done, and if he used and abused his power in the military, what is he doing as a police officer? Please vote yes on HF 295 so the criminals can be taken off civilian streets as well as military ones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kostek. And I know I've said it already, uh, and when you say things repeatedly, it almost sounds to some folks like um, you don't mean it, but um, I do mean it. And I know this committee means it as well in terms of expressing its appreciation of you uh, as a person, uh, of seeing you as a dignified person as knowing that what was perpetrated against you um, was not anything that came about bec because of who you are. Um, and uh, we are deeply appreciative uh, for your courage and your willingness to be here today to tell us your story and to encourage us uh, to create laws that can help uh, protect uh, and help 
um, make sure that when there's wrongdoing that in fact, uh, when crimes like this happen um, and are perpetrated, uh, that we will act. And uh, preferably we're acting in a way that prevent them in the first place. But thank you uh, for being with us today. Uh, members, uh, we have several members uh, who have uh, comments or questions. Let me just very quickly, if the Representative Bowler and I would certainly invite uh, uh, Mr. Kerr, Thompson, uh, Mr. Thompson um, uh, with uh, the, the Department of Comment uh, as well. Uh, maybe just a, a very quick, you know, context thing. Uh, so I'm learning a few things here, Representative Mueller. One of the things I'm, I'm hearing is that there's this requirement that there be a civilian uh, investigation uh, first. I think that's what I heard. Um, and without passing judgment on it, I'm just curious if that is in fact the case. And you know, what, you know, what 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 is the um, what, what is the principle and the proceed and the, and the um, what are the principles that are behind that? Um, and um, so anyway, just you know, generally from a total layperson's uh, perspective, just to understand uh, how things uh, up to now typically proceed and what the rationale is for that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, I am learning about um, all things National Guard too throughout my process with this bill, but I think the best person to perhaps address those specific questions is Mr. Thompson. Very well, Mr. Thompson. Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. So when it comes to sexual assault within the military, um, we're, the National Guard is much different. It has a much different process than the active component. Um, the active component when a sexual assault occurs, there's, and it's, it's done in an unrestricted manner, the reporting, there's going to be an investigation. Those investigations are typically uh, conducted by a military investigative branch such as um, CID in the Army. Um, most people are more familiar with NCIS for the Navy and Marine Corps from the, the television show. We in the National Guard do not have our own internal investigative capabilities. So we're required to have an unbiased, independent investigation. And our regulatory requirements um, have us do that through local law enforcement. So whatever local law enforcement agency um, has that has jurisdiction where the sexual assault took place, that's where we make our notification. Um, and when we're when you think about Minnesota, because we have guard members scattered around the state, um, 14,000 just about um, is our membership. We're, we're trying to establish and maintain working relationships with all of these different city police departments, county sheriff's departments, and both city and county prosecutor's offices. And sometimes, even though we, we hope for a, a, a standard approach to uh, the investigation and to the justice piece, there's all slight differences in a lot of these departments. Um, some of it has to do with manning um, and staffing and uh, the resources that are available. So we feel that having the BCA is, is if you wanna call it a one-stop shop for our investigative needs, um, that would speak to a, a standard of service um, in one sense. And again, anything that we can do to shorten the timelines is gonna be um, a win for, for all parties. Um, our adjutant general has said, you know, slow justice is often perceived as no justice. And this is another one of those instances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tufts. That's very helpful uh, uh, for me. And I, um, I, I certainly um, I'm beginning to appreciate the complexity of interacting with so many different uh, uh, units. And, and of course, part of our law enforcement um, design, if you will, in our state is to honor uh, the fact that uh, different uh, communities have different uh, dynamics at play, even as, as you mentioned, there's always a need for um, a strong element of uniformity to ensure that uh, people's rights are, are being honored uh, and followed. Um, all right, very well. Uh, we have uh, Representative Grosso, followed by Representative Wall. Representative Grosso. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Muller, for bringing this forward. Um, hey, I think you answered some of my uh, some of my questions. Uh, as far as uh, my concern was uh, to how is how is this going to mesh with the, the UCMJ? 
And I, I think you guys have that part of it worked out from what I understand. Is that correct? That's to uh, uh, Representative Muller. Yeah, oh, very well, Representative Muller. Or whoever can, whoever can answer that. Very well. Yeah, I'll let Mr. John or Mr. Thompson answer that. Very well, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there, when you look at the Uniform Code of Mil Military Justice, the UCMJ, that is more applicable to active duty. Um, there is also a, a, a document, an entity referred to as the Minnesota Code of Military Justice, the MCMG, that more addresses our Title 32 service. So there, there are differences. Um, we work continually to try to um, create more parallels between the two, but just based off of our services, National Guard members, there's some differences. So this, this also would, it would address some of those differences without, without like stepping on anyone's toes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you for that uh, for that answer, sir. Um, with that, uh, with that being said, um, what I'm what I'm hearing is that there's this there's this uh, delay. There, there's a delay with investigation. There's a delay with the the process uh, in in the civilian world, and as far as uh, uh, these these three ladies, these three testifiers that were just there at all, I'm sorry that happened. I mean that's this that should never happen to to any woman and, and please you know I just my my thoughts and prayers are, are with all of you that that healing comes and it comes completely for you um, with that being said uh, you're going at this uh, representative Muller, you're going at this at a from the angle of of putting some more BCA agents to help expedite this process I, am I correct in, in what I'm hearing some more that's right, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Grassel. It's really to not only expedite the process, but also that consistency of um, reporting. As Mr. Thompson said, these are occurring all over the state and they have all these different kinds of relationships with um, different agencies. And so it's uh, also not only to enhance the, the speed with which these happen, but the consistency. Representative Grassel. Mr. Chair, thank you. And you know, I know you. I know both you and Representative O'Neill uh, were working on that, uh, reforming the the criminal uh, crim sex code, as well. Um, is this something that could be implemented also into helping uh, helping the process go quicker for uh, sexual assault across the board? Uh, Representative Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yes, Representative Grassel, you're going to be hearing that bill on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, the, the working group was just tasked with looking at the criminal sexual assault um, statutes, not necessarily the investigations. Um, there were a number of other recommendations that were made. Um, and you might recall in 2019, um, part of our omnibus bill was passed to have for the post, post board to create standards around sexual assault investigations. Um, and so, you know, that work is, is being done at the civilian level. Um, so really our focus right now is just on having the BCA investigate those cases uh, involving guard on guard assault. Very well. Um, Mr. Chair. Representative Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's what I want to make sure that this is going to help to make sure that those investigations, both civilian and national guard just are expedited, get these things moving, get this justice uh, for these victims, et, et cetera. Um, and this is something, uh, this is something I'd, uh, I'd like to see uh, you guys consider on that, uh, on that, uh, on that council, or that committee as well, to implement something like this. Uh, last thing here, um, I had a, a similar conversation uh, with the AG's office in reference to uh, helping, helping uh, local agencies, local uh, prosecutors with uh, these heavier lift low uh, type cases. Uh, these uh, sexual assault cases are, are take some time from what, uh, from what I, I was told it, it, and such and what, I, what I've experienced that to have the AG's office do like they did back when I was on a, a task force for when the methamphetamine labs, the mom and pop labs were so uh, were exploding over the state. They had a special prosecutors group that would go to these areas, take these heavy loads 
off of, uh, of local prosecutors because it, it just, it was a very time consuming uh, process that it would take them, free them up to go back to doing their, their uh, county work and these uh, state prosecutors from the AG's office would do this. Is that something that would also uh, be something to talk about to help make sure that uh, these cases don't get stretched out and on and on and on to where you get the AG's office with a task force, you have uh, a task force such, you know, uh, agents specialized in the BCA to help with the investigation to, to expedite that. Then you have special prosecutors from the AG's office come in and help with the, the prosecution part of it. Excellent observations uh, and points, Representative Muller, uh, quickly, and then we're going to move to the next uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Grassel, it's not part of this bill, but I'd certainly be glad to have further conversations with you about that. I worked at the Attorney General's office in the criminal division at the time they were handling those meth cases, as you mentioned. I believe there was some federal funding involved in that. So, of course, anything that we would do like this would require adequately funding um, the Attorney General's office if we were to shift that function over to them. But I'd be glad to talk with you further about that. Let's visit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Grassel. Representative Long, followed by Representative O'Neill. Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just real quick before I, I turn to my question, Representative Grassel, I, I uh, carried a bill last year that would have uh, funded that work at the Attorney General's office and would, would be happy to, to follow up with you about that. Um, I, I just want to thank Representative Muller for bringing this bill forward and, and the three uh, testifiers for uh, bravely sharing their stories. And, and I'm really hopeful that we can uh, take your words to heart and, and take action on this bill. Um, it, it feels like there are, um, there's real need for consistency if we're having these uh, folks who are coming from all over the state, potentially to places like Camp Ripley or elsewhere, um, and that this having local law enforcement sort of deal with a state problem doesn't necessarily make that much sense. And I, my question for Mr. Thompson is when, when you have um, local law enforcement dealing with, uh, you know, residents of different parts of the state, um, have you seen that uh, become a challenge in, in the investigations, both in terms of the timeline and in terms of consistent results? Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Long, uh, absolutely. When we're talking about the logistics of travel to, you know, both from the law enforcement standpoint or our service member standpoint, trying to make those connections to conduct interviews um, for the investigation. If the, the more widespread, um, the, the victim, the witnesses, the offender, um, members of the chain of command, um, it, it does add time to the process. Representative Wong. Thank you, Mr. Um, so Chair. I, I would say yes, that, that, that's a definite concern. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Thompson. This, this just seems fundamentally different from you know, a typical investigation where, where folks might live in the same community and having the BCA uh, involved, I think makes a ton of sense. So thank you, Representative Muller, for bringing this forward. Thank you, uh, Representative Long. I apologize, Representative uh, Mr. Tubbs, I, I jumped in um, uh, a little prematurely. Uh, the, the video got stuck on my end, so my apology for that. Uh, yeah, I, I, members, I am struck by, I mean, we always talk about this in this committee, just, you know, the incredible um, uh, chat, logistical challenges of, of, of space and distance uh, in, in, a, in our state, uh, uh, as well as just the uh, uh, natural diversity that we have across different uh, uh, communities here, poses a particular challenge that um, perhaps in its worst case makes it uh, um, you know, inviting for wrongdoers to, to exploit. So for us to be able to fill in uh, um, uh, and prevent, fill in those gaps and prevent that kind of, of, of intentional exploitation uh, is critically important. Representative O'Neill followed by Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna thank Representative Muller for bringing yet another great bill. And this is moving the needle forward again. It is. It is taking a step in the right direction to change the culture and to seek justice for those that have not had justice. And again, I am struck by hearing the same story of serial rapists allowed to continue to rape more and more and more women. And that's, that's just what rings in my ears. And maybe it's because I also am a survivor. And so I'm very sensitive to that. That's why we did collectively, we did the test all rape kit bill and, and now we're going to be 
seeking justice and getting justice for women that have been raped and putting behind bars, hopefully, the serial rapists that are doing the raping. Um, to all the survivors, uh, thank you so much for your courage to come forward today. You are making a huge difference from one survivor to another. You are brave. You are amazing. And I am incredibly grateful that you came and you shared your story. And just know that when you leave, that you have left a very important part of you, which is the truth and what really happened. And you are going to affect change here in the state of Minnesota. You are the change makers. And I just wanna thank you and Representative Mueller and I have worked very hard in the past and will continue in the future to make sure that you have justice. So, and I'm a Republican and she's a Democrat and we don't think that rape should be partisan. Isn't that a crazy thing? Rape is not partisan. Justice for rape victims is not partisan. So thank you for your stories. Thank you for your courage. Continue to, do your, to tell your story and to help others heal. And uh, again, just thank you so much. I, I don't have any questions. I'm just very, very grateful for um, Representative Mueller's bill. And I know that my whole team will be supporting this today and we will be glad to support it. Thank you. Well said, Representative O'Neill, thank you. Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, Representative Mueller, thank you for this bill. I understand this and I'm, I'm in shock that our National Guard does not have a CID unit. They have a JAG, but the commanders appoint somebody to do the investigations on issues, not only like this, but even uh, other issues. Um, I would love to see this bill go to Veterans Affairs so they can ask uh, Brigadier Commander or General uh, Mankey, who happens to be my constituent, if he plans to get something like this started, because this uh, is something that they, they should be doing because it, uh, um, I think it's important that they should be, should be investigating not just those, but, but other things because they have a lot more latitude and, and they can actually get things done quicker through the, through the uh, CID unit. Or they have the, but uh, so that's an issue that I was always shocked when I heard. I want to thank, uh, uh, of course, thank you. Uh, the, the first testifier, uh, Ms. Grohl, for her testimony today. And I hope that uh, she still remembers the name of that officer who said that didn't want to do anything to report him to her. His, his chief law enforcement officer, because that officer should not be there. He has a duty and responsibility. The vast majority of officers would don't do stuff like that. It's the lazy ones that shouldn't have that job that uh, should be talked to and uh, disciplined. Um, we need to do whatever we can to help these victims and make sure the perpetrators are behind bars, whether it's in the uh, military stockade or the civilian. Uh, prison system. We need to get these perpetrators off the streets and away from uh, their targets and get them to help and help the victims as much as possible. I'm going to be voting for this bill in favor of it. But I like, like I said, I'd love to see it go to Veteran Affairs because this is a issue that needs to be done, be talked about in the Veterans Affairs Committee as well and to find out why these things weren't handled properly to begin with and take a good deep look at what they need to be doing as well. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Johnson. I, I think fair uh, observations. Uh, and Representative Mulder, I know it, it, it might uh, stretch beyond the language in the bill, but I'm just curious if perhaps uh, Mr. Kerr uh, or Mr. Johnson, uh, but uh, perhaps Mr. Kerr can uh, share a little bit about um, whether any, um, you know, uh, discussions or thoughts uh, within the guard uh, itself relative to CID unit uh, creation. Um, uh, I, I would not have that uh, prejudice as bill one way or the other, but just out of, you know, our own curiosity and, and perhaps, uh, you know, Representative Johnson may have identified uh, you know, another element that, that uh, might need to be addressed uh, at some point. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Kerr, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd be happy to address that, sir. The, uh, the force structure of the National Guard, which determines what units we have, is determined at the federal level. And the feds have not allocated any CID or Air Force investigation force structure uh, for a fairly simple reason from their perspective. They need those capabilities to be able to um, investigate federal crimes uh, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the reality is there are 54 different solutions for the state codes that replicate that Uniform Code of Military Justice. And so there has been no force structure made available to the states. We actually have been pursuing criminal investigation division force structure for at least 15 years. That was one of the uh, tasks I had when I was the director of plans and policy for the Minnesota National Guard. But there simply is no force structure available from the federal government and they do control how that force structure is allocated. There is also a jurisdictional issue in state law uh, that does govern, uh, the jurisdiction primarily goes to civil authorities first. Uh, there are some certain circumstances and generally sexual assault cases fall into this category where we do have secondary jurisdiction. That's where we run into these things. But there are certain things that are very important to us in the military, particularly uh, in the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator, where there's a, a superior in one position or the other. Uh, that matters to us. It does not matter in the civilian world. Uh, so that's something that we're very interested in, but a county prosecutor may not see a crime when something like that occurs. They may see a situation that occurred between consenting adults and so it's very difficult for them to make the same kind of decision that we would make. And that time delay comes in when we are granted that secondary uh, jurisdiction, our recourse is to request support from the Office of Complex Investigations at the National Guard Bureau. That's kind of their federal solution to not having CID in the states. And the challenge is they'll send a team out then and do those investigations. But as you can imagine, because they support all 54 states and territories, uh, they have a massive workload and a long lag time in getting in here and doing those investigations. We can then use the results of those investigations to take both administrative and non-judicial and judicial actions inside the Minnesota Code of Military Justice. But again, that time lag is, is horrendous uh, with regard to our service members at this time. And we really feel like having the BCA involved early will result in investigations that we can take action on much earlier in the process than is the current case. And it fills that gap for us uh, that we really don't have available to us from the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I, I, I appreciate that um, uh, a detailed walkthrough of some of the important elements here. And, I, and to me, it, it sort of speaks to, um, in many ways, sort of the unique nature of the Guard itself and how it has been structured in relationship to numerous jurisdictions from federal to you know, the very localized one. What I do hear uh, here, uh, Representative Muller, is a strong uh, will on the part of of, um, of the guard and and uh, of civilians and of legislators uh, um, to move um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know responding to this time lag issue, um, and it seems your bill uh, will allow us to uh, do that. Uh, uh, and I also hear that. Uh, there's an ongoing agenda here that needs to be worked on. Um, and so I, I look forward to this committee um, being a partner in, in doing that work with, with, with everyone here. Uh, Rep Representative Muller, um, your bill, um, uh, what, I, what I have here is that we're going to lay this over. Um, and I think the reason for that, uh, Representative Muller, has to do with uh, fiscal costs. Uh, we, we, we are directing uh, over to the Bureau of Criminal, State Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. So I'm just wondering if you can uh, just say a few words about costs and, um, you know, the, um, you know, uh, to provide some context for uh, the need at this point to let this bill over, which uh, for everyone just really means that the bill would then uh, come back up. Uh, as we put together our, our fiscal uh, omnibus bill. But I just want to check that uh, with you, uh, Representative Baller. Yeah. <laughs> Lost my earpiece there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yes, okay, yes. great. So um, you should have received the fiscal note, but I have been in touch with the BCA about this. There's a question about some of the numbers that were used. 
we're trying to get some more specific data from um, the guard or clarify the data that we have on that. So if anything, the number is going to go down and I'm hopeful that that will be the case. Um, but that's where we are with respect to the, the fiscal note and, and I think why this bill would be um, laid over. Okay, very well. I just don't want anyone to misinterpret uh, what our motion would be um, given the urgency and, and uh, you know, it looks like a really strong desire on the part of everyone to, to act here that it really, uh, is more about making sure that we've got the, that we're allocating the resources or recognizing the resources needed uh, to do uh, the work called for in this bill. Reverend Sam Muller, uh, uh, any final comments before we move to layout? Yes, Mr. Chair. And I don't want to forget to mention the letter that's in your packet yes. from another survivor. And I would encourage members to please read that letter. I know that um, Ms. Scholl wanted to read that out loud, but in the interest of time, uh, it isn't doing that, but it's still very important. And I think it just highlights again, the courage and the bravery of these survivors who have shared their story with us. Um, as Ms. Scholl has, has talked about, the weight of the burden really is, has been on her. She's been a real leader among other survivors um, in bringing this forward. It's why we've referred to this bill as Shayla's Law but it really represents so many of the survivors who have either brought their stories forward or who are living with that pain every day. And we wanna make this system better for all of them. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our testifiers and to the members of this committee. Indeed, thank you, um, uh, Representative Mullen. I did read that letter. I would uh, encourage everyone to um, uh, read it as well. Uh, so to all our testifiers uh, here today, particularly our courageous um, survivors and strong advocates for justice. Um, I wanna uh, uh, thank you as well uh, for being with us here today. At this point, uh, Representative Muller, the uh, chair will lay over House File 295 for possible inclusion um, in our omnibus finance bill. Thank you, Representative Muller. Uh, members, next we're gonna move to House File 289, Representative Edelson. Hello, committee members. Um, House Bill, I'd like to move to 289 to be before the committee. Representative Edelson moves uh, House Bill 289 uh, to the General Register. Representative Edelson, your bill is before us. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair and committee members. House Bill 289 came before this committee last year uh, and had strong bipartisan supports. I want to thank my co-authors, both Republican and Democrats, this year. Uh, my understanding is it will be moving in the Senate and Senator Limmer has agreed to give it a hearing at this point. The language in this bill seeks to provide immunity from prosecution of a victim or person who seeks to help a victim after a sexual assault from being charged with controlled, a controlled substance or underage drinking. This bill is what we know as a Good Samaritan bill. We have these laws to help uh, encourage people to help others. Uh, we have two uh, that I know of in the state of Minnesota, one to help with somebody who is having an overdose and one that's having a medical emergency in general. Um, the goal of this is to remove the hesitation to assist or help report a crime. I think when you're weighing what is more important is to um, convict somebody of uh, underage drinking or to hold somebody that has uh, committed sexual assault. I think that we would all agree that sexual assault is the worst of the crimes. Um, sexual assault is serious and this bill has been brought to me by the University of Minnesota as a, a group of working policy students and they are here to testify today um, and Mr. Chair I'd like to go ahead and move directly to them. Yeah, well thank you Representative Edelson. Um, I have uh, Gurturan Johal, um, Margot Granath, and Sam uh, Parmica. Um, and so we'll begin with uh, Gurturan Johal, if you can state your name for the record and please give us your testimony. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, everyone. My name is Gertran Johal, um, and I am a third year student at the University of Minnesota studying political science and sociology with a minor in Spanish studies. I currently serve as the speaker of forum for the Minnesota Student Association, but last year I served as the sexual assault task force chair where I had the opportunity to work with passionate leaders across our university to ensure that victim survivors were being heard and empowered through our advocacy efforts. 
one of the biggest advocacy efforts that we have been pushing for for over the past four years is the passage of House File 289, which would provide medical amnesty to victim survivors in the possession, sharing, or use of drugs and alcohol. Currently, as you are all aware, there is statutory medical amnesty in the state of Minnesota that provides immunity from prosecution for those in a medical emergency, so we are simply seeking to extend this immunity to victim survivors. Many will ask the question as to why this piece of legislation is incredibly important for the lives of students on campus. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, a drug-facilitated sexual assault can occur in two specific ways. When a perpetrator voluntarily takes advantage of a survivor's consumption of alcohol or drugs, or when a perpetrator intentionally forces a survivor to consume drugs without their knowledge. Specifically, Rain finds that alcohol is the most common commonly used substance in drug facilitated sexual assault sexual assaults clearly illustrating how house file 289 is incredibly significant in order to ensure that victim survivors are immune from prosecution Furthermore, there are a variety of reasons that victim survivors choose not to report, one of which is the fear of retaliation and prosecution due to the consumption of drugs or alcohol. Victim survivors feel silenced, and this has to change in order to best support and empower survivors. We pledge to continue pushing our peers and our elected officials to better support and stand by survivors. We have to stand by survivors and give them the opportunity to report if they choose to do so. To all survivors, we hear you, we support you, and we believe you. You, you matter, your voice matters, and your story matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Johan. Uh, next, we have uh, Margot Granath. If you can state your name for the record and, and give us your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Hi, my name is Margot Granath. I am currently a senior at the University of Minnesota with a major in political science and minors in business law and Arabic. And I have been working on sexual assault prevention and advocacy efforts through the University of Minnesota since my freshman year. Last March, I sat in front of you all and testified for House File 289, a bill to grant victim survivors and persons assisting with medical amnesty. Nearly a year, a birthday, and one pandemic later, I sit here in front of you again to urge you to pass House File 289. As a survivor, I know the deep scars and shame that an assault can leave behind. I struggled with acknowledging what happened to me for years. I'm extremely grateful I had support networks and well-funded resources, primarily through the University of Minnesota, that aided in my healing process and recovery. Many, especially those who have just been hurt, are not so lucky. A few of us students vowed to change this, not just for students at the university, but for college-age folks and minors across the state. We wrote a comprehensive medical amnesty policy for victim survivors that passed in our student government and later became the official policy for the Association for Big Ten Schools, a regional organization that represents over 500,000 students. Even still, we were disappointed at a state level. While Minnesota thankfully has good Samaritan laws, these policies do not go so far as to protect survivors of sexual violence if they are under the influences of substances that they may or may not have chosen to take. It's been tiresome to keep fighting for medical amnesty. I'm 22 now. I co-authored the original resolution when I was 19. And last year when I spoke at the house, I was 21. This isn't like a declaration of how many birthdays I've had, but it's more of a statement on how long us students have worked for this particular change in Minnesota. I have a deep respect for the legislative process. And I also hope that this is the last time that I'm here. House File 289 aims to provide valuable protections to minors in the state of Minnesota. This bill provides immunity from prosecution for victim survivors and those assisting them. This bill is an act from the state to protect those who are vulnerable and to repair some of the broken systems in our country. I urge you to pass House File 289 as an act of protection, an act of security, and an act of belief in our survivors who need support. We cannot fail our minors and survivors, the future of Minnesota, because we are unwilling to repair broken systems. We must create a better future, one of hope, resiliency, and security. That can start today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Granath, and thank you for um, coming back uh, this year. Um, and um, I, um, I, I, I share your frustration. Uh, and there's so many other uh, issues that uh, sometimes unfortunately take 
uh, too long. Uh, let's hope, uh, let's work hard more than hope uh, to get this across the finish line uh, this year. Thank you. Um, next, we have Sam Perma, uh, Parmakar from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Sam, if you can give us uh, your name for the record and give us your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Chair Mariani, and thank you, Representative Edelson, for bringing this bill forward today. Um, Good afternoon, members. My name is Sam Parmakar, and I'm the State Government Director for the Minnesota Student Association. Um, we're the undergraduate student government at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, like my peers, I'm here today to ask you to pass House File 289 to provide important protections to victim survivors of sexual assault. Um, the bill before you today is modeled off of two existing statutes, as has been alluded to, um, 340A.503, which grants alcohol amnesty protections to minors who experience a medical emergency, and 604A.05, the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Law. Together, these statutes provide limited immunity from possession and consumption charges to an individual who suffers a medical emergency while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, as well as up to three bystanders who contact emergency services on their behalf. This is, of course, predicated on the notion that when someone's life is on the line, we think it's more important to make sure they get the care that they need than it is to charge them with a low-level drug or alcohol offense. While these laws offer protections in cases of medical emergencies, the immunity provisions do not currently extend to instances of sexual assault, which is what the bill before you today seeks to accomplish. The language in our bill is modeled directly off these existing statutes and uses the same standards laid out in them. It would provide limited immunity from prosecution for underage alcohol crimes under 348.503, as well as fifth degree drug crimes over, under 152.025. The protections apply to the individual that experienced a sexual assault, as well as up to three individuals assisting the victim survivor in the reporting and investigation of an assault. This is a really important step to ensure that victim survivors feel supported when they come forward to report sexual violence. As we know, there are already so many institutional and cultural, bar cultural barriers to reporting an assault. This bill alone won't fix that problem entirely, but it will send a strong message, particularly to young people, that our institutions take sexual violence seriously. And believe me, there's a clear need for that message to be heard. According to 2019 data from the American Association of Universities, 54% of college women who did not report their sexual assault listed the fact that they were under the influence of alcohol as a reason for not coming forward and reporting. It's safe to assume that this statistic is unacceptably high for non-binary students as well. But it's not just sexual assault prevention advocates that recognize the benefit of these protections. It's law enforcement as well. In 2018, the University of Minnesota Police Department implemented a department policy providing medical amnesty protections for victim survivors. And in 2019, the Minneapolis Police Department followed suit. Since these policies have been implemented, sexual violence reporting has gone up at the U of M Twin Cities. While we can't establish a direct line of causation from this policy change, we do know that it has been part of an ongoing effort to create a campus culture that is supportive of victim survivors. Members, I, I think Representative Edelson said it best when she said, put plainly, uh, the point of this bill is, is to encourage people to help one another. Um, we wanna make sure that when someone is sexually assaulted that there's absolutely no hesitancy on their behalf that they might get in trouble for coming forward and reporting if they were under the influence at the time of their assault. Um, this is a really simple bill that just closes some of the gaps in our existing law, um, and we hope to earn your support for it today. Uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Very well. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Uh, Parmakar. Uh, with that, uh, members will open it up for uh, discussion, questions, comments. Representative Pinto. Followed by Representative Johnson. Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'll just note, as long as, as, long as there weren't other hands going up, just to note um, what a, a terrific proposal I think this is. And thank you, Representative Edelson. And thanks to the students um, for uh, for pushing it. Um, we have this um, Good Samaritan Law on the books right now, but it really is quite narrow. Uh, and to have it be expanded in this way, and I, I should note, I was just looking through the bill text. I encourage other folks to do that too. And it really feels like it, it does so in a really thoughtful and uh, 
and narrow way, and I think in a really appropriate way. And I just love the, the final testimony, the final comment that was made, um, I guess echoing Representative Edelson about the purpose being to encourage people to help other people, um, because that's what we want at that moment when somebody is um, experiencing um, a crisis or challenging situation. So yeah, many thanks to the bill's author and to, um, to the folks advancing this. Thank you, uh, Representative Pinto. Representative Johnson, followed by Representative O'Neill. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, uh, Representative Edelson, and to the testifiers, thank you for uh, bringing this forward. I always have uh, concerns when we talk about uh, uh, issues such as this. I want to make sure that the crimes are reported. I want to make sure that the suspect, if he's guilty, goes to jail. Um, but I also want to point out that in the law enforcement world, we understand these things happen where the people, where the uh, victims have been using drugs or alcohol. And in my career, and I'm not sure if uh, Representative Novotny's more than likely has the same, and I'm sure Representative Grossel has the same. When these victims come forward, they've been using drugs or alcohol. We never charge them with that. Unfortunately, the defense might use that and uh, try to blame the victim during, in the court trial, but we never charge. We wanna make sure, make sure those victims are taken care of. They get the help they need, they get the services they need. And if they've been, uh, have a habit of drugs or alcohol, we do, their, we do our best to get them the help they need to deal with that addiction problem they might have. We don't charge them out, we work with them. Um, so the is issue with the um, immunity is, though is I have a feeling uh, I see this bill is going to the general register. There's some, with the immunity issues, I think, and it's prosecutorial side of it and uh, courts are involved. I think this bill should actually go to judiciary as well to be discussed there. Um, I don't see it having any problems there, but I think uh, it should go there because it does deal with the court issues, which we do not have jurisdiction over. And again, I wanna thank the testifiers for coming forward. Um, we wanna do our best to stop anybody from becoming a victim of sexual assault. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Uh, just for the record, so uh, you know, because uh, I have the same question about judiciary. So uh, we reached out to our judiciary uh, chair um, uh, quickly. Um, it is her sense that there's no need. Uh, she will um, think about it uh, some more, but at this point, she's saying there's no need for her um, committee um, to review it. Uh, it's my understanding that the bill adds a new section uh, of, of law to chapter 604J or 604A. Um, in um, uh, civil liability limitations. However, it doesn't make any changes to existing civil liability. It adds immunity from criminal prosecution. Um, so that's the conversation with the chair. Uh, if uh, there is a rethinking of that, we can certainly uh, move the bill back, uh, you know, uh, from the general register uh, to the to the judiciary committee. But at this point, their advice to us is that uh, there's no need for them to see the bill. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Edelson. Another good bill. I believe just as Representative Pinto said, and so this is from the other side of the aisle, but it is appropriately narrow and focusing on exactly what we need to focus on, which is the victim of violence and, and sexual assault. And I appreciate the fact that you pointed out the, the very startling fact that I think you said 58% um, don't, did you say don't, they don't report because they've used alcohol, I, I think is what you said. And that actually transcends to older women as well. Um, that's probably a very similar statistic that a lot of women have been victimized because of use and um, they just can't defend themselves. And so that happens even past the age of college age. So I appreciate that you brought this forward and that we're focusing in the right area and it's appropriately narrow. And uh, I believe my whole team will be supporting you. I'm glad to hear that there's uh, that there's been a conversation with judiciary. Um, I'll leave it in your hands if you feel like that it needs at least a, a quick 
go over in judiciary or not, but uh, overall it's a good bill and um, I'll be supporting it. And I believe my team will be supporting you as well. Thank you, uh, Representative O'Neill. Uh, Representative, uh, um, oh, I think that's it. Okay, I thought I saw someone else's hand pop up, but it popped back down. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Ellison, uh, your uh, final comments, and then we'll move uh, to a vote on your bill. Um, I just, I wanna thank the committee um, and thank you Representative O'Neill um, for your support on this. That, that means a, a lot. Um, you know, and I also just wanna expand um, well, we, we re reach, reached out to um, the chair of judiciary. There, this really does keep, it's very, very narrow. Um, actually just uh, in 2020, um, the, court, the Court of Appeals actually had a case before it um, that really just says it's protecting one person as they were looking at the Good Samaritan law. So it's not looking for broad sweeping um, protections of all people, but victims do under report if they are using and I think that is already it's a challenge to come forward. Um, so I think anything we can do as a state uh, to help protect victims and make sure that they do get justice is really important. So I just thank everyone for their work on this, their support and uh, I think the University of Minnesota students um, that were here testifying today for their support and their work. Very well. Members, uh, with that, Representative Ellison renews her motion that House file 289 be referred to the general register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani? Aye. Vice Chair Frazier? Aye. Representative Edelson? Aye. Representative Johnson, my apologies. Aye. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Grossel? Aye. Representative Holland? Aye. Representative Hewitt, excuse. Aye. I'm here. Aye. Okay. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Lucero? Representative Lucero? Representative Mueller? Mueller votes yes. Representative Devotny? Devotny, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Zhang, excused. Representative Lucero. Lucero, yes. That concludes roll calls with roll call with 18 ayes. One abstain. Very well. Uh, with a roll call of 18 ayes and one abstain, um, House File 289 is referred to the General Register. Thank you, uh, Representative Edelson, uh, for your bill. Thank you uh, for the testifiers and for your work uh, on, on this, this uh, important legislation. Uh, members, our final bill uh, for today is House File 331. And Representative Edelson, you might as well. Uh, stay there. If you were in committee, I'd, I'd just have you stay in front of them, but, but um, uh, you should stay either in your office or your home, wherever it is. But, uh, just kidding. Uh, uh, Representative Ellison moves that House File 331 uh, be referred to the General Register. Representative Ellison, your bill is before us. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Um, so House 331 um, is very similar to members that were on the committee last year. Um, it was something that we left off um, was uh, we added, uh, if you are a registered predatory offender that we, you, last year we had, I had a bill that said you had to notify the home health care aid of that. Um, and so really this is, this is adding hospice uh, workers to that we already have in statute nursing homes assisted living facilities and last year this committee we added home health care services notifying um, them so this is really about public safety but it's also about workers rights this bill was brought to me by the home care association our minnesota home care association as a concern um, and it was left off last year honestly by we just didn't think about it and so this year we're coming back and that we will get the committee support to protect um, in making sure that workers do know if they are caring for somebody in hospice, that that person that they are caring for, if they are on the predatory offenders list, that they, they know. Um, and 
so right now, I guess I just would like to go ahead and turn it over to my um, my testifier, Kathy Meserly. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Edison. Uh, welcome to the committee, Kathy uh, uh, Messerly. Please state your name for the record and uh, provide us with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kathy Messerly, and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Home Care Association. Thank you to Representative Edelson for bringing this bill forward. The Minnesota Home Care Association is a nonprofit trade association representing more than 140 home care agencies throughout the state. Minnesota Home Care Association members support older adults and those with disabilities so they may re remain living in their own homes and or with their families as long as possible by providing a wide range of home-based services, including nursing, therapies, hospice services, and more. We are in strong support of House File 331, a bill that will increase the safety of hospice care professionals. Having listened to the testimony from the last two bills, I would just add that my thoughts are with all the victims and this bill is really intended to prevent that or to minimize um, more victims. Caring for individuals in need of hospice services can be incredibly rewarding. However, it can also be a challenging role because services are often provided in locations that are isolated and controlled by others. Receiving hospice services is a compassionate and personalized option for those individuals and families who choose it. And it is often a peaceful, valued end of life chapter for all involved in receiving and quite frankly, providing the hospice care. However, hospice services can pose an increased threat risk to the hospice care professionals, especially when known risks were not shared with them so they can make the appropriate assessments and take necessary precautions. The Minnesota Home Care Association brought forward House File 331 so that hospice care agencies will be notified prior to admission if an individual to be served is a registered predatory offender. This is currently required as Representative Edelson stated for other facility and home-based service providers. Hospice care providers face risks each time they enter a home alone, not knowing what or who they will encounter. And this is just a small step in helping to ensure their safety. We ask for your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Messerly, and thank you for the work that you do in your sector and uh, caring for our loved ones in the state of Minnesota. Uh, members, uh, questions, comments? Representative Edelson, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the nine questions means that uh, our members um, are embracing of your bill. Um, your, uh, your comments before we move to uh, vote on your bill. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. I'm, I am going to take the, the quiet as if I, somebody that's been in my second term, I, I'm going to take silence as good. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I wanted to thank Representative Poston as well, and Representative Frazier, I think, signed on as well um, for their support. It, this is this is a bipartisan bill um, in the Senate. It is moving, and um, it, it's, a, it's a good bill to support, and I thank members for their, uh, for their vote. Yes. Very well. Members, with that, uh, Representative uh, Edelson reviews her motion that House File 331 be referred to the General Register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Aye. Vice Chair Frazier. Vice Chair Frazier. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Edelson. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Grossel. Aye. Representative Holland. Aye. Representative Hewitt. Aye. Representative Cleavorn. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Lucero. Representative Lucero. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Novotny. Novotny, yes. 
Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Representative Poston. Aye. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh, aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Representative Zhang, excused. Representative Lucero. That concludes roll call with 17 ayes and one excused. Very well, uh, members, uh, the vote of 17 ayes and one excused. Uh, House file 331 is referred to the general register. Thank you, Representative Edelson, uh, and thank you, uh, Ms. Messerly, and thank you, uh, members. Uh, members, with that, uh, we're uh, going to adjourn. I do I just want to remind folks we are uh, we will be back. Uh, we will be convened again on Thursday. Uh, we'll be hearing. Uh, we heard reference to it earlier. Uh, Representative Motor Bill House File uh, 707, uh, which contains criminal sexual conduct uh, provisions, um, and those will be um, coming from the uh, task force that uh, we created uh, a couple of years ago. And so I'm looking forward. Uh, to those recommendations and to our discussions uh, on that. Um, and, um, you know, we'll continue uh, as well on Friday. I think we have four bills up as we continue our, our uh, focus on survivor uh, advocacy issues. Uh, members, with that, uh, this committee stands adjourned.